Can you all hear me now? Ah, wonderful. Hello, everyone. Morning. It's wonderful to be here in India. My first time in India. I feel very um, privileged and honoured to be to be here and to, to be speaking to you. I've had a, a wonderful welcome. I uh, met lots of uh, wonderful people. And it's clear from the, um, the real sense of community uh, and the real sense of open source culture, but more than that for the, um, the number of just smart and talented people, and particularly the number of young people. It makes me feel very old now. Um, but it's very clear that India has a very, a very bright future. And particularly if you keep pushing with the, the startups, keep innovating, um, and even more importantly, this, um, this culture of mentoring and teaching and bringing people into the, um, the, the open software movement, that that's going to be a real powerhouse for the future. So, that's a slightly old picture. Um, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about my background and how I got into Python, uh, got into programming, a uh, slightly unusual route. So I've been um, programming with Python since 2002, so about 12 years now. Um, but the, uh, the story happens way before that. I grew up in the era of 8-bit computers, um, computers like the BBC Model B, the ZX Spectrum, and the, uh, the Commodore 64. Who remembers computers like that? Uh, I'm not the only old codger here. That's good to see. Um, and those computers, you would, you would switch them on, and they would boot pretty much instantly, because they booted from one. They would boot to a, a programming interface. Um, if you didn't um, run a game or run some other software, the, the interface you had right in front of you was one for programming. So myself and um, hundreds of thousands, possibly millions of other kids, we learned to program on these machines. And I spent hours tinkering around with, um, with BBC Basic, as it was then, which although it was a version of Basic, um, my code was full of go-tos. Um, Horrible, horrible code. But it did have it did have subroutines and uh, and functions, um, so you could do some measure of um, structured programming. Then after that came the the 16-bit machines. Um, my favourite computer was the the Amiga 500, um, made by Commodore. And Commodore completely screwed everything up. But despite that, they managed to build a wonderful machine, and it was the first preemptive multitasking operating system way before Windows w was doing that. But uh, at the time, I didn't particularly want to go into computing. I wanted to be a lawyer. So I started doing uh, a law degree at Cambridge University. I did about a year and a half of that. Um, and then for various reasons, which is a whole other story, and if you want to hear that story, you have to buy me beer, um, I dropped out of university. Um, and I went on to sell bricks. Um, I became a salesman in a builder's merchant, selling uh, building materials, timber, bricks, and so on. And I did that for 10 years, and I didn't really do anything with computers. Um, during that time, other than um, use them for email and so on. And uh, I started playing this, um, this game, play by uh, email game. Um, I think some of them are still going. This one was called Atlantis. And what would happen is you, would, um, you had your armies and your castles, and, uh, and every week you would mail, email your orders into this um, central server using um, a specific format, and you would um, send your troops off to explore, fight battles, discover lands, uh, build castles, and so on. And everyone else would do the same. And then the central server would, would process all of these, um, these orders, work out what had happened, battles had been fought and won and lost, new lands discovered, castles built and so on. And it would, um, it would email back a report to everyone. But because this happened just once a week, all the really interesting stuff happened in between um, during that week um, and the diplomacy between the different players. And I was part of this alliance. Um, and uh, none of us had done any programming, except like myself, a, a few back in the, uh, the dim and distant past. But we figured, as this report was computer generated, it followed a, a regular format, um, and we were getting it by email, wouldn't it be great if we had um, a program that could read these reports and understand them and build up and um, combine them for us, so build up a map of all the territory we'd explore and even issue a few commands for us, a, a, a bot that would um, help us play the game. And so we, we did a little bit of research uh, on the internet 
and we decided that um, we settled on squeak as the language we were going to use, a, a small talk variant. That would have been a fine language to choose, but at the very last minute, someone said to us, no, what you should do is you should use Python. Python is great for this. And we just said, yeah, okay, sure. Um, so we started to, to learn Python. One of us, um, uh, not myself, built a, a parser built on regular expressions that could understand the, uh, the reports and build up a data structure from them. And on top of that, I built um, some code that would combine our reports, combine the maps, so that it, it would uh, a persistent data structure of all the territory that we'd explored. And also, because it knew the terrain, if you gave it um, two different locations, it would work out the shortest path between them and issue the move orders for your armies to, to move towards that location you wanted to go to. And that was an implementation of Dijkstra's algorithm uh, for pathfinding. Still, uh, variants of that um, A star, which adds heuristics to, to Dijkstra's algorithm, is still used uh, in games programming today. I found that to be great fun. I was very proud of it. Um, and what happened was I was bitten by the programming bug, I was bitten by the Python bug, I really enjoyed it, and, um, and long after I'd given up playing the game, I was still programming in Python and using it for, for various bits and pieces. And along with Python, I discovered the, the open source community, this whole world uh, of people building stuff, doing stuff together online. I've not met, um, even in the first few years of my, my programming, I lived out in the, the wilds of Northampton in the middle of England, not many computer programmers there. So for the first few years, I never met another Python programmer, but I got involved in this whole online community and through IRC, and I, I started blogging regularly. Um, I um, uh, wrote some articles for magazines, and yeah, that was back in the day when magazines were still a thing. Um, so I wrote articles on URL Lib 2 um, and Unicode, and the, some of the stuff I've done for URL Lib 2, I contributed back to the Python documentation, and I got involved in, in all sorts of other projects, open source some of my own work. And uh, After a, a few years of doing this, probably about three years, I decided I, I, I no longer really wanted to, to, to sell books, I wanted to um, become a programmer. And I, I thought, well, I've got no commercial experience, so I'll have to find an entry-level job somewhere. Horror of horrors, I might, um, I might even have to um, do PHP for a while, because uh, it seemed that's what most of the, uh, the programming jobs of the time were. But thankfully, things didn't get as bad as that. Um, I found a, a small company in London, a startup called Resolver Systems, and they were building um, a spreadsheet application that was going to take over the world, was going to replace Excel. Um, it was designed to be programmable from the ground up, and it was written with Iron Python. Iron Python being um, an implementation of the Python programming language for the Microsoft.NET framework. And, and they, I, I went to interview with them, and they could, even though I had no commercial experience, they could see from the, um, the stuff that I contributed to open source, the articles I've written, everything I've done, my involvement in the Python community, my blogging and so on, they could, um, uh, not just from the interview, but they could see the, um, the depth of my understanding of Python. And so I joined um, Resolver Systems, and I think at the time I was the first programmer um, there with any Python experience. They'd come to Python because um, they needed a scripting language for the, um, the, the spreadsheet that we were building, um, and they, they were doing test-driven development. And um, they found that Iron Python not only is a, is a good scripting language, but Python is so much easier to test than the statically typed languages that they were used to. And they thought, well, let's see how far we can get building the whole product um, in Python. So I worked with them for a few years. Um, I started to attend Python conferences. And because we were the first company using Iron Python commercially, I wrote the book um, Iron Python in Action for Manning Publications. And I, um, at PyCon, I met up with all these um, the Python core developers that I've uh, been interacting with on IRC and the Issue Tracker. Now, at, at the time, the Microsoft team who were building Iron Python they weren't allowed to contribute patches back to um, to Python. And as I was involved in both the Python community and the Iron Python community, I got Python um, commit rights, particularly to work on the standard library and to make fixes to make um, the Python standard library compatible with Iron Python. So that was how I got into becoming a Python core developer. But because of my, um, I picked up a passion for testing with Resolver Systems, I'm still convinced that good testing 
good testing, rigorous testing practices are essential for um, product and code quality and also for developer sanity. So if you feel like your job is driving you mad, um, well, testing may be part of the answer. <laughs> good testing practices. And so that was how I got involved in unit test maintenance. Along the way, I released unit test 2, which is a, a backport of the features that we added to, um, to unit test in Python 2.7. That's been bundled with Django, which was very nice. I wrote the, the mock library that came out of some of the, the testing practices in Resolver Systems. And then fast forward, and, and now I'm working for Canonical. So that's a brief history of how I got involved in Python. There's some interesting um, things to take away from that, I think. Um, the first being that um, certainly my experience, and, and not just my experience, but the experience of, um, uh, of many other people that, that I've met from the Python community, is that um, being able to demonstrate your, the quality of your work and your, involve, your ability to work with other people through your open source contributions and through having a, effectively a portfolio of work that, that you've done patches that have been accepted into other projects, pro projects that you've released as open source, um, is far more important than any qualifications that you, you may or may not get. And so if you're um, coming to Python, coming to programming, um, looking for work, the best way you can demonstrate to, to potential employers that you're someone who can work with other people, that can employ good development practices, um, and that just that you're a, a good coder, is through your co contributions to open source work. And the other thing um, is about becoming a Python core developer. Um, the first thing to say, I guess, is that it doesn't mean as much as, as you might think. Python is just another open source project like any other. So being a, and it needs, it needs developers, it needs people to work on it. So we want volunteers, we want people to become core, de core developers. It's not some exclusive club. And if you can demonstrate through um, working on the issue tracker, submitting patches, being responsive to, to changes, learning the, the, the development practices ar ar around how we do bug fixes, when it's acceptable to backport a, uh, a bug, bug fix to earlier versions of Python, and when something is a new feature really goes, needs to go newer uh, versions of Python. If you can learn those practices, if you can work with us on the issue tracker and on IRC, then getting commit rights is really much easier than you think. And, and the other thing is that it doesn't require you to know C. I got um, commit rights to core Python, not through my um, amazing C abilities, which I don't have, but through working on the Python standard library, just in Python, and there's plenty to do. So um, uh, I would recommend if you're interested in um, contributing to Python, Kushal Das is a, a great person to talk to. He's very enthusiastic about getting people contributing to upstream. Um, Okay, moving forwards, I'm now working for Canonical on a pro uh, project called Juju, and it's, um, it's uh, slightly interesting to be here talking to a, a Python audience uh, at a PyCon, as I'm no longer a Python programmer, or at least not professionally. I'm still involved with uh, Python core development, obviously, um, but uh, the project I work on, Juju, is written in, in a language called Go. Who has heard of Go? So easily half of you, maybe even more. Who's used Go? Quite a few of you. And, and, and who's actively developing something or working on something in Go? A few hands, a few hands. So even in a, um, this is a young language released by Google um, uh, three years ago, I think, maybe even more recently. Um, but you can see that, that Go is gaining mindshare very, very quickly. Um, it's at least slightly ironic given that um, one of my real passions for, for code quality is, um, is for testing. It's like, um, the, the irony being that Go is such a horrible language to test. Now that's, um, that's partly because the, the tools are immature, so the, the tooling around testing is, um, is uh, they're just not very good. But it's also the, the, the standard problems that you have testing a statically typed language. Um, you, you wrestle with the compiler, um, mocking things is hard. Go interfaces uh, help to quite a degree there. But uh, if we compare and contrast Python a little bit uh, with Go here, um, there's a lot to dislike about Go, not just the, uh, the difficulty of testing it. 
Most of the, the, the problems come, as I said, Go is a, a, a young language, it's a very small language, they're being very conservative about adding features, which is very good. They're much more focused on um, performance and the runtime um, and, and making sure that what they add to the language um, uh, r really sort of suits the, the Go way of doing things. So these things, some of these things may be addressed, but not necessarily very quickly. And what, one of the big things that, um, that hurts programming in Go is the lack of generics. What this means is you can't write a container that works with any, any kind of object, or if you do, you have to um, cast to a, an interface, which is like uh, Go's equivalent of, uh, of objects, cast to an interface on the way in, and then cast on the w cast on the way back out again. So you have to subvert the type system to do it. You can't um, work with the type system. You can't write a function that, that will take any type of uh, parameter. So for example, you can't write a generic sort function. You write an int sort, a string sort, and so on. There's no operator overloading. So you can't write custom numeric types. You can't write custom containers that behave like the, uh, the built-in slice or the built-in map. There's no method overloading, no um, optional parameters, and no keyword parameters. So if you want to write a, an API that's slightly f flexible, um, in Python you would do that with um, adding, say, Boolean flags or extra parameters, but they would, they would have a different value that you would, you would make it optional to pass those in. Now, that's something that's easy to use, but it's a useful way of creating a flexible API. What you do in Go is you either have these extra parameters, and then every caller of your function has to pass them in. So your code is littered with calls like some function, parameter, true, false, true. And you have no idea what these additional parameters are doing. You can't even pass them in by keyword to make it clearer. Or alternatively, you, um, you write a, a separate function. You have to come up with different names, and your, your users have to remember all these names for every sort of permutation uh, um, of, the, of the API. So if you have three optional parameters, that's eight different functions you have to write. Um, so all in all, this, this tends to make Go a more verbose language. You end up writing more code than you would with Python. Um, and some of the problems with Go are definitely not going to be fixed in the future. They're kind of ideological po um, positions from Rob Pike and the, the guys who are creating Go and the Go community itself. And um, the one that I think, um, and, um, and I hope none of my colleagues watch this because I'll be in trouble for saying it, but, uh, but the, 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 the thing about Go that is really just insane is that there are no exceptions. So every function um, returns a, uh, typically returns a result and an error object. And then about a quarter of your code is then, um, if error not equal to nil, return um, nil comma error. And you're returning the error all the way back up the stack, and you're losing the stack trace in the process. So every large project then imp uh, implements, and implements their own errors package. You can go out and see Facebook, who are using Google, have... Um, released one, we've, really, we've got one, then there are quite a few of them out there that, that allow you to wrap error objects and, and try and put back in some of this um, functionality that the language doesn't provide. But obviously it's not all, um, Go is not all terrible, otherwise nobody would use it. And there are a few places where Go really shines. And, and one of those comes because Go is a small language, it's extremely easy to learn. So now Juju that, that I've been working on, it's a huge project. I'm still very much learning um, Juju, learning the code base, um, learning the, uh, the way we do things. But I, I felt comfortable uh, reading Go and, and writing Go within my first week. And that really surprised me. I expect the sort of the on-ramp, the learning process to take longer than that. But really within the first week, I was, um, was uh, comfortable with significant proportion of the language. That really surprised me, and, uh, and I've certainly been enjoying doing new things, despite my uh, reservations about the, uh, the Go language. Another place that, where Go shines, because it's a young community, there's this tool called Go Format, or Go Fmut, as you spell it, and that reformats your code with the indentation and the curly braces in um, the the Go way. So there's no community arguments about how code should be formatted. Everyone just does it the Go from up way. And in fact, most people have um, set, uh, set up to, r to run this tool on their code um, on save in the editor. So you just bang out your code, you save it, and it gets reformatted the right way. And that's nice because um, uh, the code is consistent. Everyone's code looks the same. So there's something less that you have to mentally adjust for. Um, as you read other people's code, and it just reduces those pointless, stupid um, 
Flame Wars about code formatting. But the real place where Go shines is for concurrency. And the basic model for concurrency is um, asynchronous Go routines with channels for communication. You call Go and then some function call, including just an inline anonymous function if you want, and that's run off on a separate Go routine, and you pass in um, a channels for communication between Go routines or between your, your main program and the Go routine. That's a very powerful combination, and it's very easy to, to understand, very easy to, to read. And uh, even better, the Go runtime can use all the cores on your CPU. It can, you can happily saturate all of them at the same time. And this is something that Python can't do because of the global interpreter log. And if you um, ask many projects why did they, they chose Go, the concurrency story is often a big part of, of the reason why Go is used. The Go runtime itself is capable enough um, that you can have tens of, easily tens of thousands of these Go routines in process at the same time. And that's something we make heavy use of in, in Juju, and it's why Go is a, is a good fit for, um, for our project. Um, there are no threads in sight. Obviously, the, the threads are there, but they're under the hood with the scheduler, and this is uh, the, the CSP model of, uh, of con concurrency. And it's a good paradigm to, to use for concurrency. Another place where Go shines is performance. So we say that Python is fast enough, and generally that's true, but Go is faster enough. And nobody objects to their, uh, their code running faster. So you can see the, 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 the Go programming language, it's gaining mindshare. We, we are seeing some projects and some developers migrate away from Python to Go. That's not really something to be particularly worried about. Python these days is absolutely ma massive. Back when I started Python, way back in the, the dim and distant past, um, it was the, kind of this small language, had this um, small band of uh, enthusiastic devotees, um, being used mainly for, for scripting, um, for um, automation. Um, some people were using it for web programming with this crazy thing called Zope. Um, but it wasn't, it wasn't a very um, big language. But, but two things have really happened since then that have sort of exploded the usage of Python. And, and the first of that is just that computers have got faster. So the fact that Python is a, is a dynamic language, um, and so um, it does a lot more work so that you don't have to, that matters a lot less than it used to. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why I'm not particularly worried about Python on, on mobile. The Python on mobile story is, is not very good. Not many people are using Python on mobile devices. Um, and one of the reasons is they say, well, Python is just too slow. But if you look at the, um, the performance of, um, of mobile devices, that's rocketing. So that, that particular argument will just fade, I think. But Python is used everywhere now. The, the, the second thing that happened was the, the web revolution. Um, com the use of computers really exploded. And the need for people to be able to develop rapidly became much more, more important than the need to be able to, for the, for the programs to run at sort of supercomputer speeds. And program, of course, is um, famous for, for developer productivity. But still, if we, we look at the future, there, there are these um, couple of places where, where Python um, is not at the forefront, and concurrency is one of them. That's not some, something that's looking like it will change um, in the, the very immediate future. Uh, and also, I mentioned Python on mobile. Um, six times as many um, smartphones sold last year as PCs. The, the majority of computing devices already perhaps uh, are non-traditional computers, ones that you carry in your pocket. Um, so if, um, if you are concerned, or if, if in 10 years, 20 years time, you still want to be programming in Python, and you're thinking, well, well um, as a community, what can we do as an individual? What can I do to, um, to help ensure that that happens? Obviously, supporting organizations like the, the PSF, the Python Software Foundation, and the PSSI, who are looking to, to help maintain and develop the community, help move um, Python forward. That's something that you can do. Um, get involved with projects like Kivi. That, uh, that's Python on mobile devices. It is out there. It is possible to write um, apps for Android and iOS and get them into the various app stores using Python, but they need more users, they need feedback, uh, uh, and so on. Um, so use Kivi, 
use Python 3, which is obviously the future of Python. And for Python concurrency, you can donate to Armin Rigo's work on software transactional memory in PyPy, which is one way that um, Python will be able to make use of, of multiple uh, multi-core devices. So those are, are, are a few things you can do. But anyway, enough about Go. So the, the substance of my talk today is called To the Clouds. And um, so because we're talking about the clouds, you can expect a, a lot of buzzwords, a lot of jargon. Um, but one of the things I'm, I'm hoping to do is rehabilitate the term the cloud. It's the, the most overhyped um, buzzword in software engineering of the last few years. And Anyone here sick of hearing about the cloud? <laughs> I'm very sorry. You're going to hear some more about it. But what I'm hoping to do is demonstrate how um, deploying software, services, applications, your scientific computing clusters, how deploying them to the cloud, using the cloud model, how there's genuinely an interesting technology there, and why you should be doing it even if you don't want to. So we'll start um, this part of the talk with what I call my brief, potted, and mostly wrong history of the cloud. Um, this, the, the picture here on the screen, this is one of the original servers used by Google from their early days. And at the time, they made the, um, uh, what was considered radical decision that they would build their, their systems, so their cluster of servers, rather than on big iron mainframe servers or big servers, they would build it on cheap commodity hardware. And to cope with the fact that the individual machines were unreliable, or are certainly less reliable than the servers being used by their competitors, they would build this fault-tolerant architecture that could cope with individual machines failing, they could take machines out, um, and the system would still keep running. But even more importantly, they could quickly and cheaply scale up, add new servers, add new servers. And they could scale up much more rapidly and much more cheaply, much more cost-effectively than their competitors. And this, along, of course, with their, their search algorithm, was a big part of their early success. And eventually they released this, um, this platform as um, what we now call a, a platform as a service, um, as App Engine. Amazon took this to the, the next level with the, the infrastructure that they built to run their huge retail website. And they took a slightly different approach with their cluster of servers providing virtual machines as deployment targets, what we now call infrastructure as a service. Now, developers and DevOps tend to love this approach because the paradigm that it provides to you is just that you have a machine and we know what to do with machines. We're already deploying software to machines. So with um, IaaS, we can just do what we're doing, but do it in the cloud. Um, and when Amazon made this uh, available publicly, they became the dominant player in the, the, the cloud market. Other uh, IaaS public clouds include uh, Microsoft Azure, um, HP Cloud, and a whole host of clouds that are built on top of OpenStack, like Rackspace, for example. So some of the problems that deploying to the cloud solves, and then three that I'm going to particularly look at briefly here are um, resource underutilization and overutilization, dependency hell, and uh, hardware management. Now, the, 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 the core way that the cloud solves these problems is by separating your deployment layer from your physical, from your physical hardware. So when you deploy to the clouds, you deploy to these virtual machines, and you don't care which physical machine it's going to be, um, it's going to run on. And we'll look at the consequences of this as we go. So the first one, resource underutilization or overutilization, perhaps a, a situation you might be familiar with. Um, you want to deploy a new um, public-facing website, public-facing service, or perhaps even internally you have some tools, a dev wiki or dev issue tracker that you want to deploy. Um, and so you need a server. So you buy a server and you run the software on it and you're using about 10% of its resources. Or alternatively, you work for a company where the um, processes around getting new hardware commissioned and put into the network are so, so slow and cumbersome. Um, I've actually worked at a company where it, um, it took a month to get new hardware um, commissioned and, and um, 
and put in. It wasn't just the slow processes around permissions, it was the, the whole sort of system administration of getting a new machine commissioned, getting it built into the network. Um, and it took a month to do that. It was horrible. Um, and so the simple answer is just stick everything on the machines we've got, and everything starts running slower and slower. Well, with the cloud, first of all, if, if you're running on a public cloud, don't need any hardware at all. So that solves that problem. We can easily just get more virtual machines. But even um, not using a public cloud, we can um, fully utilize the resources of the machines we have with, by um, putting more virtual machines on them. And if we need more capacity, we can just add more machines to the cluster um, and let the, um, the cloud infrastructure take care of a lot of the administration processes much more straightforward. So dependency hell, perhaps even more painful. I don't know if you've ever been in this situation where you have two different applications that you, you, um, you're running, and they both use the same um, Python library, but they're both using slightly different versions of the Python library. One's an older application. You haven't ported it to the, the latest and greatest version. And what that means is you've got two applications, and they can't both be deployed on the same machine. You have to keep them separate. Or perhaps you, um, you make sure that both of your software, both of your um, applications or services, they're both running the same version. And then any time you want to upgrade version, you have to do everything in lockstep, upgrade everything together at the same time. Leading to situations sometimes where you're working on the, the new release of your software, um, you take advantage of some new feature in the a library you're using, you've upgraded the version, you've fixed all the cases where deprecated functions that you were still using because you hadn't switched the warnings on and they've now been removed. You've fixed all of those places, um, you have your software ready to go, you deploy it, and you've forgotten that something else on the same machine is using the same library. Um, you break it, an emergency rollback, emergency rollback, get everything fixed again. Um, undo the database migrations. You are using migrations, aren't you? Otherwise, you've got to manually fix your database. I've actually been in um, the situation where we've deployed something, forgotten about something else using the same dependency, um, and had to do an emergency rollback. Now, one way around solving that problem is to use virtual env um, to provide isolated um, environments for each of your pieces of software. That works fine. But what you've just done is given yourself a security problem. Because when there's um, some security um, vulnerability, perhaps it's in Django, you've now got on your server, you've got several copies uh, of, um, of your library that all need to be upgraded urgently. And they're all in non-standard locations on the file system as well. So system administrators tend not to like that feature. And you can't use the, um, the, the support of the, the packaging system of your OS to do the upgrades for you. Another way of solving the problem of um, dependency hell um, is to have an isolated deployment environment for every application or service that you run um, through having them all running on separate virtual machines. And finally, the, the last um, problem that um, the, the cloud solves, which we've already alluded to a great deal, hardware management, um, <coughs> where you're using the, the cloud um, technology. Um, you can, if you have a machine that um, fails or you need to take it out of the cluster, you want to upgrade it, you can do that without having to take down running services. And where we're over capacity, adding new uh, capacity, adding extra capacity with new machines is a lot easier. This is dynamic server management. Now, of course, if you're, um, if you're already running and managing your own servers, you probably don't want to... Um, take your data and put it on the cloud and throw away the machines, fire all your system administrators. Um, they're not going to be very happy about that. And it may be a more expensive um, and less secure solution for you. So instead, we can still take advantage of these benefits of the cloud. Ah, which reminds me, something I forgot to mention, a big benefit of the cloud, not just the problems that we leave behind, but something that we get if alongside using the cloud, we have automated deployments, then we get the easy rollout, the easy deployment of new applications and, and services, and we get the, the ability to quickly scale out existing services. Again, I don't know um, what the processes are like where you work. Um, how quickly can you deploy a, a new application? Um, 
What are the processes you have to go through? How easy is it to scale out your existing services? This is something that the cloud gives us. But in order to take advantage of these benefits, we need to have automated deployment processes. So even if you're just running um, a few servers and a, a few services, we can still take advantage, we can still get these benefits that we get from the cloud by using a private cloud. We don't have to hand the keys of the kingdom over to some third-party cloud provider. And these days, if you're using a private cloud, that probably means OpenStack. Now, I know I'll be in trouble with Kushal if uh, at this point I don't mention that there are alternative cloud technologies like Eucalyptus, for example, um, which Kushal is a, a fan of. Um, but also there's, there's other interesting technologies like Metal as a Service, which um, is another product from Canonical. And that provides you the, the dynamic server uh, management advantages of the cloud, but working directly with bare metal servers. And that's a very interesting data center technology. Um, certainly worth looking at if you're, you're managing a large amount of servers. Um, uh, you have a, your own systems, your own frameworks. You don't want to run something like um, OpenStack, or you can run OpenStack on top of Mars very easily. Um, but you need to, to manage your, your bare metal. Um, but certainly OpenStack is the, the leading private cloud framework, and it's all written in Python. And this is great news for us as Python developers, because what it means is there are a whole host of, of um, companies out there who want to pay you to work on OpenStack or with OpenStack. OpenStack is absolutely huge, massive in terms of lines of code, number of sub-projects, um, number of people using it and the, and the amount of functionality it provides. Uh, in my opinion, one of the biggest things happening in the Python world right now. So I talked about, I mentioned that um, it's very important if we're to get the full benefit of the cloud that we have automated deployments. Now, um, an important principle for this is that we treat our servers like livestock and not like pets. What I mean by this is Pets, uh, they're unique. They have names. Anyone work at a place where you g give each of your servers different names? <laughs> I do a few of you. Bad, stop doing it. <laughs> Pets, they're unique. They're lovingly cared for, hand-reared. And when they get sick, well, you spend a lot of money and time and effort to get them well again. Because if it dies, replacing it is going to be a real pain. You're going to have to find one that looks the same and lie to the kids about it. Um. <laughs> livestock, livestock doesn't have names, they have numbers. And if they get sick, well, you probably take them out and shoot them and get another one. Um. And that's, this is how we should treat our servers. We ought to be able to... Um, tear down our application servers with a single command. We ought to be able to provision our application servers with a single command. We ought to be able to scale out, add new units of our services with single commands, not having to care about all the intricate details of machine configuration and machine administration that only one person knows about, or even worse, that over the last 10 years, three people have worked, four people have worked on the configuration of this machine, and if it dies, we really have, we better hope the backup works no, there's no person who knows how to put this thing back together so that everything runs. Um, that's a terrible situation to be in. It makes scaling out, adding new services really difficult, and it makes it much harder to deploy new services. And this is where I refer to my notes. Okay, so I remember. So um, the reason DevOps and developers love the, the infrastructure as a server paradigm is that it provides the, it just provides the, you have a machine to deploy to model. So we get to leave a whole bunch of problems behind, but one of the problems we take with us is we still have to um, provision, administer, configure the machines um, in the cloud. And there are a whole host of tools that will help you do that, that will help you automate doing that, but they, it still means you have to do it. Some of those tools you, you're probably mostly familiar with, um, Chef, Puppet, Salt, um, Ansible. It's quite a common problem, quite a lot of people um, trying to solve it. Uh, and even Docker, which is the latest and greatest, the latest hot new thing. Um, Really, that's about uh, image-based workflows, but in as much as people are using um, Docker images as deployment targets, it's about machine provisioning. Let me show you a yet still more excellent way. 
as developers and as um, even as DevOps teams, we really don't want to think in terms of machine configuration and administration, or at least I don't wa want to. Um, what I want to think about is the services I'm deploying and how they're related. My application needs a web server, it needs a load balancer and cache, it needs a message queue, a database, and the, those are all related. That's what I want to think about. The, the key parts of my infrastructure and how they're related, not individually what dependencies, what ports need to be open, um, firewall rules, all of these kinds of things. Those are, those are details which um, ideally some tool would take care of for me. And we call that, this is something we call service orchestration. Canonical is something we've been talking about for a few years and that is, is kind of picking up um, in the industry that what we want to do is orchestrate our services, think in terms of our services, not think in terms of machine provisioning and administration. This on the screen here, this is a view from the Jujugu. Not necessarily something you'd use uh, in production. You'd use the command line scripts and configuration that you can keep in version control. But it shows um, deployed services and how they're related. And even for production, it's a great way of seeing the, the health of your running systems. So some of the key advantages that Juju as um, an automated service deployment um, tool, and not just deployment, it, it manages the life cycles um, of, your, of your services. Some of the key benefits that Juju provides. We've mentioned service orchestration. Cloud independence is an important one. It works with Amazon EC2, um, Microsoft Azure, HP Cloud, Joyent, OpenStack, Metal as a Service, and also LXC and KVM um, containers for, for local testing. That's great because you can take exactly the same um, configuration, exactly the same system that your production uh, deployment, your prod stack uses, deploy it locally, check that everything still works, make changes, redeploy, uh, destroy your environment, recreate it, check it still works. Even better on your continuous integration server. You do have a continuous integration server, don't you? Running a, a barrage of automated tests against um, a, a system provisioned in exactly the same way as your production stack. Um, who does have um, that? that um, Ooh. <laughs> now, some of you may be a researchers and students, so you have excuses. For everyone else, it, um, the basic rule is if it's not tested, it doesn't work. You may not know why or how it doesn't work, but believe me, it doesn't work. If it's tested, it might work. <laughs> but if it's not tested, it definitely doesn't. Even worse, you have um, people going through... Um, manual tests by hand. And that's terrible, and the basic reason is because people suck. They're bad at doing repetitive things. Um, and computers, they love doing repetitive things. That's what, that's what they're there for. So if it can be automated, automate it. Um, so LXC containers are a great tool for this. Um, again, another show of hands. Who's heard of and used LXC containers? So some of you. Um, LXC containers are lightweight Linux containers. They, they can share the kernel of the running system, so you get native performance. But it's, it's an isolated container, just like a virtual machine. So they're great for things like this, for local testing, for deploying as deployment targets for your um, continuous integration. They're also great for developing. Um, if you have... Um, if you're setting up a development environment is complex, requires installing a bunch of dependencies, maybe adding private PPAs, private repositories. Um, doing that on your system is a pain because you get it wrong, you screwed up your system, you have to reinstall everything. Instead, create an LXC container, LXC-create. Um, it's slow the first time because it downloads the image and then after that, creating a new LXC container, very lightweight. LXC start, SSH into it, and then you're just SSH'd into your um, Linux environment. Install all your development um, requirements there. You can either share the home drive or back bind mount into it. Uh, and then you do your work inside the LXC container. And if you screw that up, blow it away and create another one. Very lightweight, very easy to do. Fantastic tool. Well worth uh, exploring, even if you're not interested in any of this. Um, which, of course, you all are, I know. Okay, uh, and for, certainly as Python programmers, one of the big advantages uh, of Juju, um, Juju knows how to deploy 
um, services and applications through things called charms. And those charms, you can write them in any language, but the best language to write them in, and the language used for most of them, is Python. So you get to codify your deployment infrastructure in Python code. And that's the heart of DevOps, isn't it? Um, we don't manually maintain our systems. We don't manually cowboy in changes that then no one can quite remember. Um, we keep everything um, as scripts. Uh, and configuration files that are completely automated that we can hand off to somebody else. Um, this is DevOps. And with Juju, you get to do it with Python. I, I think with um, some of the other popular deployment tools, you get to do it with Ruby. And uh, um, I assume that most of you are here because you, you like Python. <laughs> um, and one of the best things is um, that for the key parts of your infrastructure that probably most of you are using some of, there's a whole host of charms already written. Uh, there's a community around the writing and the creation of these charms. So things like Hadoop, Elasticsearch, um, Ceph, MongoDB, Postgres, MySQL, Squid, Apache, um, HAProxy. Um, the parts that you're um, using but that, that um, aren't your core applications, there's probably already a charm out there that you can use. So let's have a quick uh, look at an example. This is deploying a Django app. The app is called Dpaste. It's on GitHub. Uh, you may be familiar with the application already. It's a paste bin. Come on, come on. Now, sometimes this gets a bit antsy coming back from sleep. But, uh, ooh, can you actually see that? Let me try reducing the resolution and uh, make it a bit... Uh, So this is the Pastebin application. It's running on my local system. The, the URL, which you probably can't see there, is a 10.0.3 URL, which is um, that's a, so the IP address. That's a, a cloud IP address, but it's actually running in an LXC container. So just to demonstrate, if I run Juju status, it spits out a load of information about the running services on the system. And that, that um, IP address, if I look at the, which I will just scroll past, I'll probably scroll past, the Apache IP address, that's the public address of the uh, 10.0.3.131. That's served by Apache um, running through this, um, this pipeline of services. The actual so the, the, it's not just a charm that's been deployed, it's a bundle. This is jujucharms.com, which is the, um, the charm store. If you search for dpaste there, you can, um, can find this bundle of services uh, developed by my um, colleague, uh, Simon Davey. The, the, the charm store, this is actually um, a fake Juju GUI, so you can do a test deploy to the charm store just to see how the services look, configure units, uh, and so on. But I've also, do, it doesn't actually do a deploy. I've actually installed the, um, the Juju GUI into my local Juju, so I can get a view of the running services. I'm, I'm not going to attempt to do the full deploy here now, um, partly because it takes time, but also because um, it's uh, network heavy as it um, fetches the dependencies, and so on, and I don't want to tempt the demo gods too much by relying on the network here. But what we've got in this bundle of services, we've got an Apache that's doing HTTPS termination. This is just the standard charm. We've then got HAProxy running in, uh, uh, working as a load balancer. This is configured to send the same URL to the, the next um, thing in the, the pipeline is um, Squid working as a cache. And HAProxy here is configured to send the, the same URL to the same unit of the cache. Um, obviously, a cache only works if the, the, the the, the unit that has that URL cached actually gets the, um, the request. Then the, the next thing in the pipeline is HAProxy doing standard load balancing um, using the, the, the standard algorithm, least connected. And that's going to our application dpaste, which is the thing right in the middle. You can see just off to the side the Juju GUI uh, charm that's been deployed. That's the running instance of Juju GUI that we're looking at not connected to any of the other services, but it gives us this live, it's connected to the Juju state server, so it gives us this live view into what Juju is doing. 
There's an interesting one to the left, the, um, the connection, this is Gnunicorn, which I never know how to pronounce properly, so I'll just say it confidently and you'll all assume I'm saying it correctly. Um, Gnunicorn, Gnunicorn is the, um, the whiskey runner for our Depaced app. We could have built that in to the uh, Gnunicorn charm. It needs to run on the same unit as, um, as Depaced. But somebody else has already done the work of writing a Gnunicorn charm for us, so that's run as a subordinate charm, which means it runs in the same unit, but we can just um, pass the configuration information to it. There's also PostgreSQL connected to um, uh, uh, Depaced. Depaced is a standard Django stateless application, and Postgres provides the persistence layer. We can see here uh, on the left is some information about Depaced. We've only got one unit running. Through this URL here, um, I can configure new units using constraints of the, the CPU power, the CPU memory I want it to, to create if this was going to, um, to Amazon. And that would then uh, create new virtual machine instances using the constraints we provided. And if I want to scale up Depaste and add uh, new units, I can uh, do it here. This would be the, the same as um, from the command line, juju, add units, depaste, and then tell it to add five new units. So we can just scale that. I might actually try that and see what happens. This has been running locally on my system for several days now, so quite what the state it's in is anyone's guess. Scale out with these constraints, default CPU cores, one gig of memory each, which will be interesting as there's only three gig on this system anyway. So let's have a look. That's, that's going. So that's now doing a... So you can see the bar has changed to yellow because only one-fifth of the, uh, the units are actually um, up and running. And the other ones, they're now in the process. Uh, this is going to fail, actually. It's going to fail because I have Wi-Fi turned off so I don't get any silly notifications. So provisioning those machines locally is going to fail. But the interesting thing is, because... Um, the charm defines a bunch of hooks that are run when things happen. And then a charm provides um, in, uh, interfaces. The Postgres charm provides a Postgres interface. And the Depaste charm says, I know how to talk to a Postgres interface. So when we add a relationship, the, the charm hook runs. There's some Python code that runs. And uh, it's, uh, it, it, it's told by Juju, the live Juju state server. It's, it says, um, this relationship has now been joined. Postgres puts um, into the Juju configuration, um, it creates a username and password, so no need to um, hard code those um, in configuration if you, if you don't want to. Um, the Postgres charm can create those, put those into the configuration for the application. The application is told, you've now this, uh, the, the configuration has changed, you've, just jo uh, you've now joined a, a relationship, um, and it can get that information from Juju. And so the, the Depaste charm runs, does the setup to provide the database connection, uh, and, the data, uh, and the Postgres um, the, the, the charm runs to make that information available. So this is service orchestration. Um, the great thing is when we, uh, because we've established this relationship here, as we scale out and add new units, Juju knows that, well, there's um, a relationship between Depaste and Postgres. So as I add new units, I need to add that, that, um, I need to add that um, relationship as well. If we added more Postgres units, the charm is um, clever enough to know, right, now I'm running in replication mode and there's some reconfiguration to happen. So when we're um, with these charms properly in place, as we're defining our services, we don't need to think uh, uh, in terms of, uh, of, what, uh, of how to configure and set these up. That's the, um, the job of the charm, and it manages not just the configuration of the individual service, but it manages these relationships too. If I now, um, four pending units, we've got a little triangle telling us that something is wrong. And this is because it can't provision these machines. Something that, I, um, I, in fact, I didn't mention that is important from the point of view of cloud independence um, because the deployment target is separate from the description of your bundle of services, um, if you're a, a young startup, you're deploying to Amazon, then you get onto Reddit and Hacker News, and um, you're scaling up, it's getting more expensive, your customers realize their information is on American servers, um, and they really don't want that. Um, 
So you want to move to deploying to OpenStack uh, or deploying to your own servers. You, you put OpenStack on them. You just retarget your deployments and exactly the same deployment and configuration. Just run it against OpenStack. Um, export your data, re-import it, and there you've, um, <coughs> you've moved over nice and easy. So I only have a few minutes left. I keep mentioning these charms. Charms is just a directory structure on disk. We can fetch them from the charm store if it's an existing one. We can pass in um, some YAML configuration if it's a charm that needs configured. That uh, we will keep under um, version control, obviously. But we can also have them locally. If for your own application, you will probably take an existing charm and fork that and configure that, um, set that up specifically for your application. Um, that blue you can't, really can't read. I'm sorry about that. This is the output of tree, or part of the output of a charm. We have a bunch of metadata and YAML files, and the hooks that I mentioned that are run when configuration changes, on install, when a re relationship is joined or left. Here, they're, they're all some links to the same hooks.py file. And then we've got a charm helpers package that's bundled in the charm. Here's some of the Python code. This is the install hook. And surprise, surprise, that's installing a bunch of stuff. Um, I mentioned that um, the services that you saw were from a bundle of services. And this is the configuration file um, used by the Juju deployer to deploy those. This is the, the first part of the, the, uh, the YAML, the, the deploy YAML bundle. The configuration for the um, the dpaste app. It, this is actually fetching. The, this is the Django framework charm. It's actually fetching the um, the dpaste app from um, GitHub when you deploy it. So this is something you will probably not. Well, it's likely that that's not how you will want to deploy in production. Um, and then the other services and some of the the configuration options for them. Just a text file. So actually getting Juju up and running, once you've um, got it installed, the, the, although the um, Juju deploys Ubuntu workloads, we're actively working on getting it deploying CentOS workloads and Windows workloads. We have a working prototype of um, deploying to Windows. So uh, if you're in the unfortunate position of having to maintain a, uh, a Windows network, Juju deploys SharePoint. Juju deploy SQL Server. Um, Juju, um, but there are client, even though the, it's for deploying Ubuntu workloads at the moment, there are clients for Windows and for, um, for the Mac. So we can deploy to, to um, OpenStack, but from, from Windows, from, from a Mac computer, if that's what you need to do. So once we have Juju is installed, we generate a config file. Um, then we do Juju switch local here. That um, tells Juju that we want to deploy locally. Um, if I was deploying to OpenStack, I would source my .novarc, the standard OpenStack um, file that, that puts my um, credentials into the environment. Juju can just read those from the environment. So I'd just do Juju switch OpenStack. You can um, modify environments.yaml, define new environments, but there's no need to m uh, mess with it for, for the, the, the standard cases. Similarly, with Amazon, there's a, a couple of environment variables I can put in place to make my credentials available. And then Juju Bootstrap, and this creates the running state server that's going to manage the lifecycle of the, the services using the provider API. Um, so talking to, to Amazon, talking to Azure, when it creates vir virtual machines, making sure that only the required ports are open. Um, when we upgrade the charm, um, managing that. And, it, um, and again, having this running state server that manages your, your, your services and knows what state they're in, checks they're still running and alive. This is a key difference between Juju and other uh, automated deployment tools. And having done that, we can then call Juju status and it will tell us what the state of our local Juju is. And there's the, the basic command, deploying something from the, the charm store, Juju deploy, Juju GUI. And then for deploying a whole bundle of services, I run Juju Deployer on this configuration bundle. So that's um, a very whirlwind tour of Juju itself. Hopefully, I've um, demonstrated to you um, why um, the cloud is an interesting technology, how it's useful, um, even if you're managing your own servers uh, and services. Thank you very much.
Do we have any time for, for questions? Yeah. Thank you, Michael. We have time for three quick questions. If you compare Juju with Chef, then uh, what is it analogy? What are charms analogically similar to cookbooks or recipes? I'm I'm really sorry. Could you repeat the question? Uh, if you compare Juju with Chef, then what are the charms uh, you know similar to? Are they like cookbooks or are they like standalone recipes which are, then can be combined together? So how do the charms compare to ch Chef and the, the hooks? Are they standalone and can you compare no, them? No, as in if, if at all you want to deploy, a, 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 say, you know, PostgreSQL or, you know, My, MySQL, then you have standalone recipes for them, standalone char charms from them, right? Right, so, yeah. So can charms, you know, combine with each other and form like a logical umbrella of uh, this? So uh, do you mean can I deploy different services to the same virtual machine? Uh, can you uh, logically combine different charms into a single charm? Um, well, you can, yes. You can simply have the charm do both. Okay. Um, you, you would then create a new charm. Um, but really, there's, there's not a great deal of advantage to that because um, you're then maintaining your own charm that does a lot more work than it needs to. Um, and you lose this advantage of separate, um, isolated deployment uh, environments. Um, it's much easier just to um, to use the two existing charms separately. If you want, if if the the root cause, so certainly you can combine them. Um, if if what you really want to do is though is to deploy services onto the same virtual machine, just to use less virtual machines, have denser deployments. One thing we're working on is um, allowing the use of LXC containers within virtual machines. We already have that for Metal as a service, so we achieve a higher density, full resource utilization by deploying to LXC on Mars. We're working on having um, the problem of having containers inside. Um, Amazon instances and uh, Azure instances is container addressability and we're working on the network model for that. Um, but that's one way we'll solve the problem. But you can already say Juju deploy um, Juju GUI dash dash to machine zero and have it installed on the same machine as the state server. Um, so they're, they're logically they're separate units but they're combined, they're running on the same machine. So if that's what you're after, we, we, we can get it that way. Combining charms could also be done. As I mentioned with the dpaste, we have a separate communicorn charm which is a subordinate charm. A subordinate charm always runs on the same machine. That's one way of kind of combining charms. Um, and we've done it that way rather than building uh, the GNU Unicorn runner into DPaste. Yeah, so is it is Juju like a counterpart of let's say Red Hat's OpenShift uh, origin or something like? Because How does it compare to OpenShift? Yeah. So Red Hat um, OpenShift is a platform as a service, um, more competing with Heroku than um, the likes of Amazon and uh, Azure. Um, and OpenShift is a, a hosting technology rather than a deployment tech. Uh, maybe it combines both. I'm not really very familiar with OpenShift. But something that's interesting in recent years is I think um, uh, infrastructure as a service has largely beaten platform as a service in the market. There are a few big players. Um, Heroku, Salesforce is huge in platform as a service, but maybe that's really software as a service. Um, but um, Heroku may be huge, but you know, if you look at how do they compare in size to, to Amazon, really their you know, uh, infrastructure as a service is, is much bigger. It, it seems to have beaten out um, platform as a service. And I think that's because you know, if you're targeting a specific platform, you're really locked into that. Whereas with infrastructure as a service, you're able to move provider much more easily, particularly if you're using a tool like Juju rather than um, directly hard coding your calls to the, to the Amazon API. If you're, if you're working directly with the Amazon API, you're tied into Amazon. If you're using um, a, a deployment tool like Juju or, or some of the other tools that knows how to deploy to any of these IAS, you're, you're much less tied in. That's harder to achieve with platform as a service. Hi. Uh, Some days back, I used one of the tools that you created, RST to web. So I just uh, curious to know what motivated, inspired you to create that static site generator. I'm really sorry. Can you uh, RST to web? I just uh, so nowadays there are so many uh, static site generators available. So what inspired or motivated you to create this 
static site generator static site languages no, uh, static site generator RST2 web so what he asked he asking that what motivated you to write a static site generator not really oh static. uh RST2 web yeah oh my goodness so um nowadays there are so many static t um uh, site generators why did i write rst to web well the answer is when i wrote rst to web there weren't so many static type ge site generators <laughs> i wrote this for my own website um got 10 years ago so i was way ahead of the curve <laughs> um but you probably shouldn't use rst to web the the, the more modern ones are much better. The only reason I use it is because I'm a bit stuck with it. But uh, there we go. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>